free body diagrams. <clears throat> uh, it's going to be helpful for you to draw a free body diagram of an item you're interested in. In the example on the left here, we're interested in forces on the beam. So notice what they've done. They have removed the frictionless roller and replaced it with its reaction force. That is a substitution. Take it away, put the arrow in its place. We've removed this mass and replaced it with an arrow. And we might label that mg, mass times gravity. What is the answer on page 16? The correct answer is D. This problem, a simply supported beam with a pin and one roller, is uh, a determinate problem. Good, thanks for asking. Uh, how about this pin? We should remove that pin and replace it with its reaction forces. What is really irritating is that there is no horizontal arrow on this diagram. There should be one. Why did the person who made that drawing not put a horizontal arrow there? Because they did some engineering and they decided that the value of that arrow would be zero so they didn't even bother it. In fact, what they did is they used our equation. They said sum of forces in the x direction equals zero. Well, that uh, you know reaction force from the pin on the right uh, must equal zero. They used up one of our equations. So uh, you would probably do the same, right? But for the purposes of teaching people how to do free body diagrams, it'd be nice to have a zero length arrow there. Okay, what's bothering you about you, the uh, problem on page 16? Write out a question. A little much later on, we're going to briefly tuck, uh, talk about the uh, method of sections. And when we do that, we're going to be lopping off a portion of a diagram. Well, just like everything else we remove, when we remove it, we'll have to replace it with some arrows. So free body diagram is just a process of removing stuff and replacing it with arrows. D is determinate. There's, yeah, this is another pesky trick. Read the problem carefully. It's kind of a double negative. All or bad except which one? Well, they could have asked which one of these is determinate, but instead they ask all or indeterminate except it's basically a double negative. Got it? So D is determinate, which makes it the correct answer to all of the others are indeterminate except D. Yeah, they're playing with the language there. Ooh, that's a bright box. Okay, here's a problem for us. What is most nearly, notice I am reading the problem statement, what is most nearly the reaction force at support B on the simply supported beam with linearly varying load? Well, we're going to talk briefly about what to do with a distributed load. And distributed loads come in the uniform variety. A uniform distributed load is often a weight. For example, if you go to buy a steel beam, you might go shopping for a W6553 I-beam. That's a wide flange beam, 6 inches tall, and a weight of 53 pounds per foot. So the 53 is pretty convenient. It tells you, you know, if, you, if you want a 20-footer, you can calculate what the weight's going to be and how many people you need to lift it. Very nearly, you can calculate the cost based on the weight. So uh, a uniform distributed load, like pounds per foot, is pretty useful. I'm not going to delve too much into that because you're civil engineers and you deal with pounds per square feet, pounds per linear feet all the time. So I'm thinking you're probably pretty okay with a uniform distributed load. 
We'll just remind you that when you have a non-uniform distributed load, such as the one shown here, the thing to do is to break it into two separate loads, one of which is a rectangle and one of which is a triangle. So rather than handle the trapezoid, uh, now we can calculate uh, the area of that trapezoid, right? That's not really a problem. The problem is figuring out where the centroid of a trapezoid is. It turns out that finding the centroid of a trapezoid is annoying enough that you're better off just chopping it into triangles and rectangles. So we've got to find this reaction force B. How are we going to do it? Well, let's go ahead and put our reaction forces in the diagram. I could draw a sort of zero length arrow there, right? But uh, you're welcome to ignore it. It's a pin, but we know it's n there's nothing horizontal here. Which is greater, reaction force A or reaction force B? I'm thinking reaction force A is bigger. I'm going to go ahead and draw it as such, just to kind of keep myself oriented. I could keep myself oriental, but that would be cultural appropriation. Um, so A is bigger than B. We're interested in B. What can we use to uh, figure out the, the unknown reaction force at B? Well, we've got, well, you probably know. But let's say you didn't know. What would you do? If you find some problem on the exam and you have no idea what to do, what do you do? You start with what you know. I know there are at maximum three equations of motion. Sum of forces in the x equals zero. Is that equation going to help us solve this problem? Absolutely not. One down, two to go. Move on. Sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. Okay, well that looks like uh, A minus the total distributed load plus B, mm, two unknowns, and it's not going to help us. So we're down to our last equation, sum of moments about any z-axis equals zero. And we're going to have to use that equation, make that equation work. What should our center of rotation be? If we're interested in B, and if we just as soon ignore A, We'll pick a center of rotation on the line of action of a force we don't care about. So we'll do moment about A. So that's what we're going to do with this problem. To do so, we need to find a way to draw a good free body diagram that doesn't have a distributed load in it. So let's figure out what we can replace these distributed loads with.